the Celeron brand from Intel had a rough start. Those of us who witnessed the launch of the cashless Celeron will probably remember this line of CPUs as unfit for anything more but basic workloads. But is the Celeron's reputation for poor performance justified? After all, the term Celeron came from the same marketing company that came up with the term Pentium. Celer is Latin for Swift and also appears in English words like accelerate. The suffix on apparently comes from the term turned on or enabled. Another fun fact is that Celeron is a 7 letter word and consists of 3 syllables, like Pentium. So with all that positivity in the brand name, how could the Celeron become a synonym for poor performance? To understand how we ended up here, we should refresh our minds about what other platforms were around at the time the Pentium 2 was released. In mid-1997, the Slot 1 platform and the first Pentium 2 models hit the market. With clock speeds of 233-300 MHz, Intel gradually departed from the Socket 7 platform, which was compatible with the original Pentium, the Pentium MMX and many other Socket 7 variants like the K6 CPUs from AMD. Intel wanted the Socket 7 platform to die and instead have its new Slot 1 and Pentium 2 CPUs take over. Unfortunately for Intel, there was one issue that users did not like. The price of Pentium 2 CPUs was 3 to 4 times higher than that of alternative offerings from AMD and Cyrix for the Socket 7 platform. Of course, Intel's performance was unmatched, especially in terms of floating point calculations. But not everyone needs the last cutting edge technology. If you just needed a PC for writing emails, do some spreadsheet calculations or fill your calendar with meeting requests, a Socket 7 CPU was more than enough. But Intel had nothing to offer for this segment, since the company was already in the last production cycle of Socket 7 Pentium MMX CPUs. Meanwhile, AMD announced future K6 and K6 II models for the aging Socket 7 platform and was collaborating with other companies to lift the frontside bus from 66 to 100 MHz. Socket 7 was a threat to become the budget and mainstream platform, leaving Intel the enthusiast and thick wallet segment. Intel realized their shortcomings and went back to the drawing board to offer a low-cost alternative for the Slot 1 platform. Maybe the bad reputation is the result of this exercise that made end-users upset with Intel, because it feels like not much effort was put into the resulting new kit on the block, the Celeron. It is, in fact, a Pentium 2, just without the cache chips. Intel stripped both cache chips from the cartridge and sold a Pentium 2 without the level 2 cache. Wait a second. Level 2 cache was a thing for a very long time. My 386 board has level 2 cache chips on the board? 486 boards had level 2 cache chips on the board? Socket 4 boards have level 2 cache? Up until socket 7. Intel then removed this cache from the motherboard and put it on the cartridge for Pentium 2 CPUs. So there are no longer any cache chips on the motherboard. The slot 1 platform was built to have the level 2 cache closer to the CPU die, on the cartridge. And now, Intel releases a CPU without. As if... Nobody's gonna know. Nobody's gonna know. They're gonna know. How would they know? How would they know? How would they know? I, I just... I can't. Oh my god! Many reviews pointed out what Intel may have hoped to not be a big deal. The Celeron's mediocre performance was rightfully blamed on the missing level 2 cache. In certain situations, a fast Pentium MMX could outperform the new Celeron, even though it had the clock frequency advantage. Less than 3 months after the last Covington CPU was released, the codename used for the original Celeron, Intel released a new model codenamed Mendocino. This time, however, Intel made sure to include 128 kilobytes of level 2 cache, one fourth of that of a Pentium 2. But there was a major difference in the cache architecture. You will no longer find cache chips on the cartridge. Instead, the 128 kilobytes are integrated into the CPU die. And there is another difference. The cache on Pentium 2s is clocked at half the core frequency. On the new Celeron, however, the cache operates at the full CPU frequency. And yes, that's right, the Celeron was the first retail CPU from Intel with integrated level 2 cache. In hindsight, Intel probably bought time with the release of Covington, since Mendocino needed an updated die design. 
Stripping the cache chip seemed a simple enough solution to offer a gap filler in form of a neutered Pentium 2 until the arrival of Mendocino. To reduce costs further, Intel built a new platform based on the EX chipset, which only supports frontside bus frequencies up to 66 MHz. But if you wanted, you could also run your Celeron 300A on a slot 1 motherboard featuring the BX chipset, like an Asus P2B. For many months I was on the lookout for Mendocino Celerons at the scrapyard. First I found a Covington rated for 300 MHz. And a few months later, I found two Mendocino 300A right next to each other. That was sheer luck as we will see later. But I always wanted to experience this CPU from Intel myself. And now I had everything I needed to make this video. Even though the 300A clocks at the same frequency as the original Celeron, Unreal Tournament renders a lot smoother. Instead of 13 frames a second, we get close to 20, which still isn't perfect and wouldn't classify the Celeron as a gaming CPU, but it shows what difference the level 2 cache brings to the table. If you wanted to reach 30 frames per second, you needed the top of the line Pentium 2 450. But bear in mind that this CPU would set you back around 669 US dollars in August 1998. The Celeron 300A, released in the same month, was obtainable at just 149 US dollars. You just had to compromise on performance. There was nothing you could have done to get more from your Celeron. You got what you paid for, right? Well, wrong. Of course many of you know that the Celeron 300A was one of the best CPUs for overclocking back then. If you were lucky, you could just change the front side bus on the motherboard from 66 to 100 MHz and with a fixed multiplier of 4.5, the Celeron would most likely work at 450 MHz. And suddenly, you've got a Pentium 2 450 with 128KB of level 2 cache instead of the 512KB. But that smaller cache was also clocked at 450MHz. The larger cache on the flagship Pentium 2 was clocked at 225MHz only, half the CPU core frequency. On the P2B, we just have to move one jumper. And voila! The Mendocino 300A posts at 450MHz. Unfortunately, this is all it did. My model is not capable of operating at 450 MHz. Windows 98 does not even show the loading screen, and the CPU got more unstable by the second, until I got stuck on the boot screen. Luckily, I found two of those CPUs at the scrapyard. The second Celeron seems unimpressed by the 50% overclock. It just chews through the boot routine and brings us to the Windows desktop. CPU-C shows us a Mendocino 300 clocked at 450MHz with 128KB of level 2 cache. This CPU completed all benchmarks and they felt on par with the results received by a Pentium 2 450. We will go over a few charts in a moment, but first have a look at this Unreal Tournament gameplay and tell me if you can spot a difference to the bigger brother with 4 times the level 2 cache. So, then let's go over a few benchmarks. In total, I collected the results of 5 CPUs. The Covington at 300 MHz, then the Mendocino at 300 and 450 MHz, a Pentium 2 450, as well as a Pentium 3 450. First up is CPU-C. I assume that CPU-C does not take advantage of any special features on the CPU, because they all score identically, depending on their frequency. That also tells me that the Pentium 3 Klamath is nothing more than a Pentium 2 with a SSE instruction set. We can observe a similar behavior when we look at the floating point scores. 3D Mark 99 favors the Pentium 3, but our overclocked Mendocino beats the Pentium 2. And we can also see how the level 2 cache puts the Mendocino ahead of Covington. The CPU benchmark heavily favors the Pentium 3, most likely due to the use of SSE instructions. However, the Mendocino once more beats the Pentium 2. In both 3D rendering scenes, the Celeron punches in the same weight class as the Pentium 2. 
only the Pentium 3 continues to outperform the Celeron at the same frequency. An interesting trend is observable when we move towards larger texture sizes. The Pentium 2 is ahead initially, but this advantage diminishes at 16 MB. At a texture size of 32 MB, the Celeron outperforms any other CPU on this chart, including the Pentium 3. And finally, let's have a look at the Unreal Tournament results. With 29 frames per second, the overclocked Mendocino 300A has no reason to hide behind its bigger brothers. Considering that the Pentium 2 450 and the Celeron 300A were released on the same day, with a price difference of 520 US dollars, you had a tough choice to make. As we have seen today, not every Celeron 300A can overclock to 450 MHz. However, if luck was on your side, you could score flagship performance for a fraction of Intel's asking price. The price and the potential performance you could get from a Celeron 300A makes it the best CPU you could have bought in 1998. Of course, that is my opinion. But I'm curious if you owned one of those CPUs back then. Did you try to overclock it and were you successful? Let me know in the comments. Unfortunately, one of my Celeron 300A is not capable of booting at 450 MHz. But I do not want to give up yet. We could try to overvolt it a little bit. What if we increased the stock voltage from 2 to something like 2.1 or 2.2 volts? Unfortunately, I do not have the ABIT BH6, a motherboard that was very popular to overclock Celeron 300A CPUs. This board allowed to override the CPU voltage. I also do not want to use an ASUS P3BF. Therefore, we need to go the manual route. If you want to learn more about how slot 1 cartridges communicate with the motherboard to tell which voltage it should supply, then please watch my other video about this unknown slot 1 CPU. I created a spreadsheet for that video which can help us to figure out which pin on the edge connector is responsible for which voltage ID. To get 2 volts, all pins need to be shorted except for VID0 on pin B120. Coincidentally, B120 is connected to resistor pad R6. And this resistor pad is indeed unpopulated. As you can see, I updated the sheet to include Mendocino and Covington CPUs. The updated sheet is already available on my website. So, we could go to 2.05V by bridging R6. But I believe this voltage is not enough to make this CPU stable. The next option is 2.1V. In this case, we still need to short resistor pad R6 and disconnect the other 4 pins. Today, I want to solve a problem without soldering, so let's move on to 2.2 volts. Okay, R6 should be open? Check. VID1 on pin A120 should be grounded? Check. But the remaining pins are supposed to be open. Currently, they are all connected to ground. So we need to disconnect A119, B119, and A121. Since I do not want to scratch or cut the traces on the PCB, I will use tape to isolate those pins on the edge connector. This method is extremely dangerous, because if the tape moves and one of the covered pins accidentally makes contact with the motherboard, you could send 3 volts and more into the core. That voltage would instantly fry your CPU. So, if you plan on doing this, be careful. I will use some captain tape, a small knife, tweezers and patience to get this done. And we're done. The pins are isolated. 
I ran the tape around the edge connector to give it more support. I hope this reduces the risk of moving the tape when we insert the cartridge into the slot on the motherboard. And the Mendocino posts, but it did that before. The question is, does it boot into Windows? But before we attempt that, we should also check if our voltage mod works. In the BIOS, we can see that we indeed get 2.2 volts. Our tape mod works! Okay, then let's try to boot into Windows. CPU-C shows us the details we expect. Similar to the other Celeron, but this time at 2.256 volts. Let's see if we can play a round of Unreal Tournament. crash to the desktop. 2.2 volts is not enough for this Celeron 300A to run at 450 MHz. Of course, we could try to increase the voltage further, but we already did over 10%. So I'd rather accept the fact that this Celeron 300A won't turn into a Pentium 2. That is proof that you were gambling if you went for this CPU to get flagship performance. In the end, it depends if you're lucky in the silicon lottery. Nevertheless, I'm very happy to be able to share this tale of Celeron CPUs with you. And what a coincidence that I found just the right mix of CPUs at the scrapyard. And now I'm curious what you have to say about Intel's Celeron 300A. Are you surprised by the performance you could have gotten from such a CPU? Is it weird that Intel started integrating level 2 cache into the die for low-cost CPUs? Of course, I will look forward to each of your comments. And if you enjoyed today's video, hit the like button. Finally, a big thanks to all my Patreons. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.